Uh, respected uh, Professor Ravi Narayan, chief guest of today's function, Professor Mohan Rath, sir, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Bose, uh, head of the institute, my colleagues, uh, and uh, all the students and the department heads and guests, whoever has joined this online uh, HM Patel search Founders Day celebration. Good morning to all. Uh, the great son of Dharmaj, Sri Bigubai Muljibai Patel, widely known as Sri H.M. Patel Sahib, was born at Mumbai on 27th August 1904. He had very high position in central government and retired from services in 1959. His post-retirement life was dedicated to the upliftment of rural people in and around Vallabhidhyanagar, which naturally became his Karma Bhumi. Sri H.M. Patel was one of the few persons in Gujarat who emphasized the importance of learning English in order to keep pace with the changing world. His emphasis on learning English has been proved correct with the emerging horizons of the computers, information technology, and biotechnology. He was a perfectionist par excellence and long-term planner. It's a, it has been a tradition of H.M. Patel Institute of English Training and Research to celebrate his uh, founders. Uh, we celebrate his birthday as a Founders Day celebration every year. Today also, as we all very much aware that it is his birthday and we have gathered here online to celebrate his birthday. I request uh, Dr. Monas Thakur for the invocation. Please, Dr. Monas. Thank you, sir. Oh. वक्रतुंड महाकाय सूर्य कोटि समप्रभ निर्विघ्नम कुरु मे देव सर्व कार्येषु सर्वदा शुक्लां ब्रह्म विचार सार परमा आद्यम जगत व्यापिनिम वीणा पुस्तक धारिनिम अभयताम जाट्यांद कारापहां हस्ते स्फाटिक मालिकाम विदधतिम पद्मासने संस्थिताम वंदे त्वाम परमेश्वरिम भगवतिम बुद्धि प्रदाम शारदा ओम तत्सत श्री नारायण तू पुरुषोत्तम गुरु तू ओम तत्सत श्री नारायण तू पुरुषोत्तम गुरु तू सीध बुद्ध तू स्कंद विनायक सविता पावक तू ब्रह्ममस्त तू यह शक्ति तू ईशु पिता प्रभु तू रुद्र विष्णु तू राम कृष्ण तू रहीम ताओ वासुदेव गो विश्वरूप तू चिदानंद हरि तू अद्वितीय तू अकाल निर्भय आत्मज्लिंग शिव तू ओम तत्सत श्री नारायण तू पुरुषोत्तम गुरु तू 
ಸಿದ್ಧಭೂತ ಸ್ಕಂದ ವಿನಾಯಕ ಸವಿತಾ ಪಾವಕ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಮಾನಸ್ ಸರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ವಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸರ್ವಧರ್ಮ ಪ್ರೇಯರ್ ಎಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಐ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ದಿ ಹೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಎನ್ ವಿ ಬೋಸ್ ಸರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಸ್ಪೀಚ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಬೋಸ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಆಮ್ ಐ ಓಡಿಬಲ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಸರ್ good morning to one and all respected chairman engineer bitu bhai patel dr amar davin patel the doctor of hm patel saab honorable secretary dr sg patel saab joint secretaries rc talati sir dr devi narayan the heads principals teaching and non teaching staff and dear students we celebrate our founders day on 27th august every year and this time due to the pandemic we are <coughs> forced to organize this function online charutra vidya mandal sachambatel institute of english training and uh, research is the brain child of sri hm patel sir the visionary who had a very clear mission that is to promote the use of english in gujarat let me offer my tribute to our founder and extend my warm welcome to all of you today we have our chairman engineer sri vikubai patel who happily agreed to preside over this function i welcome our chairman who always gives stress on the quality of education under his leadership we have a new university in vidyanagar now the cbm university although our institute is now affiliated to indian institute of teacher education gandhinagar we all work as a team for the development of the society the main pillars of the team along with our chairman are sri manish bhai patel the vice president professor s p patel honor secretary professor r c talati joint secretary sri mehul bhai patel and sri vishal bhai patel i welcome all of them We have today Dr. Ravi Narayan Chakragorty as the chief guest of this program. Dr. Ravi Narayan is a professor at the Regional Institute of South India Bangalore where he trains in service teachers in English language pedagogy. He has an MA in Tassol from the University of Lancaster UK he is the lead coordinator of the British Council India's action research mentoring scheme for the year 2019-20 he has conducted many teacher education courses research projects and materials development workshops across India He has presented a paper at the International Association of Teachers of English as a foreign language conference held in Manchester in 2015. He worked as a chairperson of English course books for the Department of Education, Government of Karnataka. His book on Learn English, Teach English, English skills for teachers was published by Oxford University Press of India. Devi is a passionate is passionate about reading, training teachers and researching classrooms. I'm happy to say that Devi was my classmate uh, at the English and Foreign Language University Hyderabad in uh, PGCT and PGDT. I welcome Professor Devi Narayan. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good George. morning. I welcome uh, Dr. Mohan Raj, my teacher, all the heads, principals, teachers, and students, and well wishes who are watching this program online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, both, sir. Uh, as we all know that uh, Bangalore is a beautiful city of Karnataka state, and uh, almost all the states of South India are full of wealth and knowledge. and i think people as well in this regard today we have amongst us uh, professor ravi narayan from regional institute of english south india bangalore as a chief guest for the today's function i request him to say a few words about dr h m patel sahib and then deliver a lecture uh, professor ravi narayan thank you dr anil and thank you dr bose uh thanks again for the wonderful introduction i deem it an honor to pay tribute to hm patel ji is indeed a great pri privilege to deliver this memorial speech on a special occasion uh let me show hm patel ji's photo to the audience first yes can i share my screen one second yeah is it visible is a photo visible yes yes, yes. 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 oh so this is achim patel ji uh, who worked as a senior indian civil servant officer in the first years after independence and as many of you will know he was the finance minister and then he became the home minister and the central government and after his retirement i think he dedicated himself to the field of education he worked as a chairman of the charuthar vidya mandal which founded vallabh vidyapeet that was later named as sardar patel university vallabh vidyanath and he was instrumental in establishing hm patel institute of english training and research in 1965 ah uh, it's a real honor to pay homage to hm patel ji on this special occasion so um, i really appreciate the initiatives and the efforts of the organization in conducting such celebrations every year this is very very important to recall the contributions of great visionaries and remember their achievements and recognize their efforts and go forward the tradition and culture so thank you for inviting me and for having me on board today and we at the regional institute of english have a long association with hm patel institute of english training and research uh both are training institutes regional institute of english bangalore and hm patel institute of english are teacher training and teacher education institutes they are premier institutes in the country and we had the faculty of hm patel institute of english research scholars and students coming to rai bengaluru for training programs for conferences and many such professional development activities so i'm happy that we are carrying forward this legacy and helping each other in a professional growth and i must thank professor bos for inviting me to deliver hm patel memorial speech today right what i'm going to do now is i'll present three scenarios this is the first scenario i'll give you just 30 seconds to see these three scenarios i'm going to show you three pictures so maybe 30 seconds to just have a look at the pictures this is scenario 1 Okay let me make it full screen. Yes. So what do you think is happening here? This is scenario 2. And this is scenario 3.
Anybody who wants to respond to these pictures, what 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 are these three scenarios? So what do you what 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 do you guess? What is your understanding of these three scenarios? Oh, so scenario one, yeah, this is a picture. So it's about the recent controversy that happened in UK. This is a grading controversy, controversy related to the grading of students. This is called great inflation in UK. So the A level and GCSE exams were cancelled because of the COVID-19 pandemic and grades were assigned to students based on teacher predictions. But then, you know, right, we don't trust teachers. So naturally, teachers predictions were not taken into account completely. The grades they predicted based on students' continuous performance were moderated by standardized algorithm by the examination body. And what has happened is because of this standardization, because of the application of this algorithm, students got one grade lower than teacher predictions. And 79% students did not achieve their predicted grades, it seems. They did not get their predicted grades. And this has affected their admission to, this will affect their admission to universities and colleges. And the interesting thing is that this has happened because of the down, because, see what has happened is the downgrade, downgrading the results of those who attended state schools. So those students who attended state schools, their results were downgraded. And the results of pupils at privately funded independent schools were upgraded, thus disadvantaging pupils of a lower socioeconomic background. I think this is very unfortunate. See, so first of all, depending on standardized algorithm, depending on machine grades, and you know, we, this is what we are moving towards now. Uh, tests are being conducted based on artificial intelligence, based on computers. So can we trust machines completely? That's one scenario, how students are affected by this, by these grades, exams. So I would call this an obsession with exams and results. We are all obsessed with exams and results. Recently, I saw a note on social media from a university professor. Uh, there was a note to her students. Soon we will meet again in the examination hall. All right. Soon we'll meet again in the examination hall, not in the classrooms. So once upon a time, we used to believe that the destiny of the nation is formulated in the classrooms. But now it is, I think, the destiny is decided in the examination halls. So irrespective of what students do during the pandemic, where they are, what are their feelings, what is the situation they are in, we have decided to meet them in the examination hall. Interestingly, another professor, so this also became viral on Twitter actually, another professor, he, he, was he was conducting online classes and whoever had problems with internet connection, he used to call them, talk to them personally. And when he was talking to one particular student, university student, he heard thunder and rain in the background, it seems. So heard thunder and rain in the background while speaking to that student over the phone. It transpired that the student who lived in rural Karnataka was sitting outdoors under an umbrella, braving heavy rain to get a signal. She was sitting outdoors under an umbrella, braving heavy rain to get internet signal. So we are not, I mean, worried about this. We are worried about conducting exams and declaring the results, grades. So the battle, examination hall is a battleground. Uh, so I think we are still obsessed with exams in spite of the dramatic changes that are happening, in spite of this health crisis. All right. And the second scenario is about our obsession with syllabus coverage. This is again, you can see most of the students attending classes online. Teachers trying to teach online, all right, designing PPTs, using whiteboards, and trying to reach out to students online. 
So the education is happening in Google Classroom, not in the real classroom, not in the physical classroom. And there are four to five hours of online classes every day, which students have to attend. Small little kids have to attend three to four hours of online classes. And most of these students have three to four devices at home. They need to do assignments. They'll Google most of the time, get answers from Google. They need to download worksheets, upload assignments. And then online tests are being conducted. Marks are announced. So there is still a rat race going on. Unfortunately, students are learning in isolation. There is no learning community as such. They're not interacting with other students. So for example, children are not, not worried uh, about others. It's okay if four or five students get opportunities to answer all the time. Because in the regular classroom, there is some hesitation. How will the other students react? How will they respond? Will they talk to me tomorrow if I go on answering the questions? See, they need to face other students, right, in the class. Whereas online, a child can go on answering. A child can dominate because she is safe. So I'm a little concerned about this learning in isolation. So what, what are the values that they are acquiring? Right? And the third scenario is this. I would call, see, there's a teacher standing in the middle and there are students who have maintained social distance, wearing masks, trying to engage themselves in learning. Uh, I would call these teachers frontline warriors. Teachers who are struggling to reach out to students in remote villages. There are lots of challenges in reaching out to students. They are moving beyond the physical space of the classroom. So look at this. They are trying to engage students in common areas, in public places, sometimes in temples, sometimes in small theatre complexes. This is another teacher who is try, trying to uh, talk to students, engage them in make, making sure that learning continues to happen. And these are real barriers. So I think what has happened is the global health pandemic has provided a clear picture of existing inequalities. Now, what are the challenges of teaching and learning during the pandemic? Uh, I had an opportunity to interact with 60 to 70 teachers uh, in my state in Karnataka, and I was talking to them about the challenges of teaching during this pandemic. And most of them say that four months of gap. This crisis began in March, right? So March, April, May, June, now July and August, five, six months of gap has changed their mindset. Teachers are saying it has changed students' mindsets. And I hope it has just changed students' mindsets, not teachers' mindsets. The, the gap has really, really affected students. And then it's very difficult to take them back to studies. This is what teachers are saying. Difficult to take them back to studies. And teaching outside the classroom, school is very different from teaching inside the school. They also find it challenging to design activities, conduct group work, create English atmosphere. These are all their concerns. And then I ask them, okay, if these are the problems, difficulties, how did you overcome these challenges? It's interesting. Their responses are very interesting. And one particular teacher said, see, look at their struggles. One particular teacher said, I have divided the students into three groups. Some students have smartphones. I conduct online classes to them. Some students have basic phone sets. I call them, try to motivate them to self-study and assign activities through conversations. For other students, I go, to, I go to their doors and facilitate learning by assigning some work with the help of worksheets. This is what she has planned. Identifying students who have smartphones, conducting online classes wherever possible, identifying students who have basic phone sets, helping them by calling them, by text messaging them. And those students who don't have any of these facilities, 
she tries to reach out go to their doors help them with worksheets this is actually called vidyagama in karnataka this is the new initiative of the government of karnataka vidyagama under which teachers are supposed to go to students doorsteps identify students call them to a common place and engage them in learning uh, this is a, a new vent academic venture and when i spoke to another teacher she said so look at these the way she has expressed herself i'm mapping the students according to geographical areas availability of phone or smartphone textbook and workbook resource talking to parents through zoom meeting creating whatsapp group and posting the activities in the group so what to see what to see what to say what to write read so look at that so the, 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 the interest their commitment to do something all right so sharing video links audio clippings my voice messages worksheet practice they want to do something they want to reach out to students but there are challenges and the overall experience is i mean it is it's not so successful teachers are saying uh, not very successful but we have gained rich experience and some teachers have we have tried online lessons but failed so they 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 ready to admit we have tried online lessons but we have failed and they feel that regular classroom is the best place for teaching and learning so i hope all of us realize this the value of a physical classroom where all the students come together learn as a community and then they also they were able to rope in head, head teachers crps block resource persons parents and students that is the best thing that has happened teachers have got feedback from headmasters headmistresses resource persons and parents and students so what what is this concept like teaching remotely what are some of the advantages some of the disadvantages and many teachers seem to say that greater individual attention is possible through this scheme vidyagama scheme when we go out talk to students individually it's possible to pay them greater attention we are able to connect with their parents it has not happened actually so now we are able to connect with them call parents and then engage students and we are sharing videos and audios whatsapp groups are created now but still it's difficult to help with reading and writing skills students can listen to audios watch videos maybe they can record their voice and but it's difficult to help them with reading and writing skills and some more challenges for example teachers are saying we are trained to teach face to face but remote teaching is different and it's challenging teachers are not trained to teach remotely this is all new making a video preparing an audio teaching online where have they got experience have we have not trained them right they were not ready for this and then they are saying we do not know students feelings their moods and reactions when we teach online when we call them on their phones correction is difficult feedback is difficult and getting their attention follow up not so easy or i some students it seems it, it's very difficult to track them know their status they're going out with their parents to fields and it's difficult to get their attention get them back to studies and follow up is not that easy and then i asked some of these teachers after the schools reopen will you continue with some of the remote teaching techniques you have adopted now okay you have adopted some innovative techniques you made some videos or you will you continue to use these strategies these resources once the schools reopen and many have said yeah, we'll continue we'll continue self learning techniques with children so i find this very interesting self learning techniques either to maybe we have not explored this we'll continue self learning techniques with children we'll teach them how to learn on their own learning to learn all right and then we'll give worksheets as home assignments maybe till now they were doing the worksheets in their classrooms in the, during school hours we can do give it as a follow up assignment if they need extra care then we'll take classes online 
So depending on their needs, depending on their levels, we may conduct classes online as a follow-up. And then some teachers are saying every class can be recorded and shared with students for revision or for those who miss the class. This is also a great idea. Every class can be audio or video recorded and shared with students to reinforce their learning. So teachers will continue some of these techniques. They, they, they think they'll, they'll continue. And these are some of the lessons learned during the pandemic. One teacher said, I have realized that children cannot depend on the teacher for everything. I'm really, really happy that at least now we have realized all of this, that self-learning is important. Using worksheets for follow-up is valuable. Taking classes for reinforcement is again useful. I think these are all good lessons that we have learned. And then students cannot depend on teachers all the time. The students need to be empowered so that they learn a few things on their own. We need to prepare them for situations like this by equipping them with various learning methods. I think this is also a great lesson that we have learned. We have to equip them with different learning methods. As we all know, I mean, it's very common to see students learn by rote, right? So, so far, maybe they have they have involved themselves in rote learning, in memorization. But this is not helping now. During the pandemic, if students are not able to read on their own, then what will you do with the textbook lessons, with the passages? If students haven't developed independent reading skills, if they cannot read silently, comprehend a passage, then what are the ways to engage them? Because we have not done this, we have not developed independent reading skills, self-study skills, now we are struggling. And now we realize we need to develop learner autonomy. We need to equip them with various learning strategies. And this pandemic has opened up many options to improve our teaching. And I'm glad this is all this is coming from teachers, from primary high school teachers. This pandemic has opened up many options to improve our own teaching methods. And another teacher said, you know, young teachers said, the pandemic cannot stop children from learning. This is what she is. No pandemic, no pandemic can stop children from learning. And another teacher said, the pandemic has taught me lessons for life. So look at that. It has taught me lessons for life. So I think the global health pandemic has provided a clear picture of what steps forward we need to take. What, what steps forward we need to take? What is our future course of action? I think this is the time to think about this. And if you look at National Education Policy 2020, I mean, it has proposed a new pedagogical and curricular structure, like three, first three years, from the age of three to six, and then two years, and then three plus three plus four. So three plus two, that is five, five plus three plus three plus four. This is a new structure proposed by the NAP 2020. Uh, I'm a little concerned about this because from age three, children will get into the formal school structure, they get into the formal school structure. I'm just hoping against hope that they will not become a cog in the machine. See, they will become a part of this formal education system from age three. And they should not become a cog in the machine. And Sir Ken Robinson, for example, he has said, it's equally important to develop literacy and creativity. Foundation literacy is important. Foundation numeracy is important. But what is equally important is creativity. And as Picasso said, all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. Now, all these online classes, for example, have, I mean, I don't think they have, they have made attempts to develop children's creativity. Now, we are 
I mean, we are worried about board exams. We are concerned with content subjects, grades, results. What about other exams? Like, see, in Karnataka, we have successfully conducted SLC exam. But every year, soon after SLC exam, the same board will conduct exams for other fields. For example, there will be, this is called Department of Other Exams. They conduct exams in music, in dance, in other instrumentals, musical instruments. So nobody is talking about that now. So are these skills not important? Is creativity not important? Is it only JEE, NEET? And all these competitive exams? What about students' creative skills? What about other talents? And then teaching is a creative profession. Teachers are the lifeblood for the success of school. This is what Ken Robinson has said. Teachers are the lifeblood for the success of schools. So great teachers not just pass on information, they mentor, they stimulate, they provoke, and they engage. So these are the roles played by teachers. They're not there to transact the course book content. They're there to mold, shape, mentor the future generation. They're there to provoke students, stimulate their thinking, develop their creativity and higher order skills. So what does UNESCO say in this backdrop? Does it does UNESCO give us any ideas about way forward? And there is a document that I found, Education in a Post-COVID World. UNESCO has come out with nine ideas for public action in the post-COVID period. And this is what the UNESCO document reports. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed vulnerabilities. It has shown the great inequalities that exist in the world. It has also surfaced extraordinary human resourcefulness and potential. See how these teachers are struggling to go out, meet students and teach them in streets, in public places. So it has also surfaced extraordinary human resourcefulness and potential. Decisions made today will have long-term consequences for the futures of education. And the document says, value the teaching profession and teacher collaboration. We need to value the teaching profession and value teacher collaboration. There has been remarkable innovation in the responses of educators to the COVID-19 crisis. With those systems most engaged with families and communities showing the most res resilience. We must encourage conditions that give frontline educators autonomy and flexibility to act collaboratively. I think this is important. We must, we must give them autonomy, flexibility to act collaboratively. And we should protect the social spaces provided by schools as we transform education. I mean, again, UNESCO feels that it's important to protect the social spaces provided by schools as we transform education. The physical school, the physical classroom is very, very important. The school as a physical space is indispensable. Traditional classroom organization must give way to a variety of ways of doing school, but the school as a separate space time of collective living, specific and different from other spaces of learning must be preserved. We must think of alternatives. We must go for a variety of ways of doing school, but the school as a separate space time of collective living, specific and different from other spaces of learning, like on this must be preserved. And the document goes on to say that we should make free and open source technologies available to teachers and students. Now, because it's many, many teacher students cannot access these resources, there's a huge gap that we have created. So we should make free and open source technologies available to everybody. Open educational resources and open access digital tools must be supported. 
Still, see so the next part is interesting. Digital technology that enables communication, collaboration, and learning across distance is a formidable tool. Digital technology is essential. Yet, we should be increasingly concerned that a shift to remote online learning will exacerbate inequalities. Shift to remote online learning will increase the gap, will exacerbate inequalities. It's an illusion to think that online learning is a way forward for all. I think this is also very, very important for all of us to remember. So I think it's time we thought about alternatives in education, alternatives in assessment. It's time we thought about alternatives in syllabus. Let's think of alternatives in the system. What are the alternatives available? How best we can make use of these alternatives? Alternatives in assessment, alternatives in education, alternatives, uh, how best we can provide alternatives to, to students? I think that should be the concern. Uh, yes. So with that, I think I'm going to conclude for some time. And then maybe if there is time, we can have a small discussion, debate. Yes, let me stop sharing my screen. Yes, I'd like to stop here. And then if there are questions, I'm open for discussion. Thank you, Professor uh, Ravinara. In fact, uh, whatever you said, uh, I am uh, very much agree with uh, that. Uh, now, during this pandemic situation, we have uh, challenges, especially remote challenges are real challenges for us. Uh, of course, uh, interior part, uh, villages, uh, gap is increasing, though we have technologies and all. So we need to uh, think over this. So uh, once again, thank you for enlightening us with new thoughts and ideas. Uh, I request Professor Mohan Raj, sir, to say a few words. Mohan Raj, sir, please. Uh, thank you, Anil, for uh, asking me. Um, I would first of all like to congratulate uh, Ravi Narayan for a very, very well organized, very systematic talk. I think uh, he began the talk with uh, a beautiful motivation by creating, uh, presenting three different scenarios. When he asked that particular question, I thought uh, I would, I wanted to answer it as it captures the history of development in the last six months. That's that's exactly what I was thinking, and uh, uh, that's that's beautifully beautifully presented. But I was much 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 more impressed with uh, the survey that he has conducted, and my heart goes to those two teachers whose responses uh, he presented extremely succinctly. Uh, the first teacher who was able to. to go out of a way to categorize her students into three particular categories and meet them, understand their needs and cater to their needs into three different manners. I thought uh, such teachers are far few, but and I wish I wish their tribe really, really increases. Then uh, he moved on to how this could uh, uh, lead to some of the recommendations that have been given in NEP. Uh, with your permission, Ravi, I just would like to s comment one thing. Uh, the first three years, I don't know, I'm not sure, at least as per the document and the thinking that goes into the document, they will not become cogs in the wheel. They will certainly not become cogs in the wheel. The uh, document is, I think, fairly, fairly explicit which says that the children are allowed to attend school so that they, they get used to the atmosphere of the school. They get into the habit of attending the school and build a rapport with the teacher and they, they see the teacher as the second member of the family, an additional member of the family. Along with that, 
without really having to read and write, they get a lot more familiarity with the language. Their, their vocabulary gets rich, which forms a foundation to uh, study as soon as they become five or six years old. I think this is the philosophy that's uh, projected as far as NEP is concerned. Uh, but I think your point of view is uh, uh, well taken. It's well taken. And I also wish, like you, I also wish they don't become cogs in the wheel. Certainly, they should not become cogs in the wheel. And I, I also liked uh, the excerpts you took from a UNESCO document, which is a, a very recent document. It's an extremely um, useful document. I was somehow thinking that you would bring in uh, Prabhu, uh, NS Prabhu, uh, when you were talking about uh, some of the recommendations that have been made here. Um, uh, one, one, of the things, one of the things that the teacher said, uh, children can, uh, 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 teachers are, no, no, sorry, you said something. Learning, learning, uh, children do not learn everything because of the teacher or something like that. I don't recall that. I thought you would bring in uh, Prabhu when he said teaching is hoping for the best. I, uh, that's, uh, that's a brilliant article, uh, yeah. which uh, I think he wrote while he was in Singapore. And uh, that's a brilliant, brilliant thing. So, so I, I, I saw a lot of connection between yeah. the two. And uh, I now look forward to your suggestions on alternatives to education. I think that's a brilliant thing that you have done. Uh, the, I, I like the way you have developed it so very systematically. Online is not the solution and you cannot do without online. This is a catch-22 situation we are in. I think that's where we are. But catch-22 situations are good. They at least allow you to think, if, if not anything. They don't block your way. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you for that brilliant talk. And thank you, Anil, for asking me to comment. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mondra, sir. Uh, I request uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rajendra C. Jadeja, uh, former director of HM Patel Institute of English Training and Research, uh, to uh, share his ideas. Uh, Dr. Jadeja, please, sir. Sir, you have to unmute, sir. Dr. Jadeja, sir, you have to. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, morning, Dr. Ravi. And uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, I would like to start by paying a tribute to Dr. H. M. Patel, uh, who's. Uh, anniversary, birth anniversary, uh, we are uh, celebrating by organizing this occasion. Um, I'm sure all of us um, know that he was an ardent admirer of uh, Dr. Triguna Sen, uh, who in fact uh, laid the foundation stone of H.M. Patel Institute of English, who came to Vallabh Vidyanagar, Dr. Teguna Sen, uh, and immediately after coming here in the parliament session, he presented the three language formula. So I uh, would like to point out to Dr. Ravi Narayan and all the friends here, uh, that in India, what is really important uh, is that we keep in mind the bilingual and multilingual perspective. And while I think it is important to focus on the pandemic right now, um, we must remember that pandemic is a, is a passing phenomenon and that it is not going to be with us forever. But as soon as uh, we are free from the pandemic, I think the new education, national education policy uh, should 
come into force and we should all try to understand uh, what is the national consensus. One of the things which happens there is of course uh, uh, greater emphasis on the child's mother tongue. And it says very specifically that even in schools where the medium of instruction is not the child's mother tongue, um, it would be advisable to encourage the use of mother tongue to a definite extent, to, a, to the extent that it is necessary or helpful. Um, so uh, that is one uh, policy recommendation which I think we will have to pay attention to and which we will have to try to understand better uh, in the days to come. So I would like to, to know if uh, Dr. Ravi Narayan has uh, specific views on this. Please tell us. Sir, I, you're talking about bilingual, multilingual education? Uh, my, my, my views on that, yeah. I'm talking about the recommendation in the new national education policy, uh, where uh, it is very specifically recommended that in schools where the mother tongue is not the medium of instruction, where some other language is the medium of instruction. Uh, the teachers would do well to also use the mother tongue to some extent and facilitate learning. I think it it is done uh, in line with UNESCO uh, yeah. recommendation. And I think in India, uh, we need to understand the implications. Yeah, that's your so, right, sir. You're right, yeah. sir. Yes. Yeah, and we are introducing bilingual medium of education from this academic year, in fact. Wherever we have English as a medium of instruction in public schools, the government is planning to introduce bilingual medium in English medium schools, yeah, where the subjects will be taught in both the languages. Maybe we have to work out the mechanisms, arrive at a model, uh, as it's happening in some countries, for example, the teacher will start teaching core subjects in the first language for first 15 minutes. Next 15 minutes, the same concept will be taught in English. And then again, switching back to mother tongue, then continuing. That's one model we have. And another model is first day, the core subjects are taught in L1. And the second day, the same topic is taught in L2. So that's a kind of bilingual model we have. So we have to think of such models and make schools bilingual i think that's my opinion sir wherever medium of instruction is not students mother tongue or the dominant language yeah. thank you thank you indeed uh, thank you jadeja sir and uh, ravi uh, now it's time to seek blessings from the head of the family of Charutar Vidya Mandal. I request Honorable Chairman Engineer Sri Bhikubhai Sahib for the blessing and presidential remarks. Uh, Sri Bhikubhai Patel Sahib. After the foundation of Charuta Vidya Mandal uh, by Sri Bhairaka and Sri Bhikabhi Sai, Dr. H. M. Patel Sai mimicked it. He was a voracious reader and a visionary having excellent managing skills. This institute came into existence due to the, his uh, powerful vision. Today is his birthday. I am really happy that H. M. Patel Institute of English celebrates his birthday by inviting renowned experts from delivering memorial lecture every year. On behalf of Charuta Vidya Manda, and on my personal behalf, I pay tribute to Dr. H. M. Patel Sai. I am thankful to Dr. Ravi Narayan of RIAE for his thought 
provoking and memorial lecture. And I congratulate Dr. Bose and his team for successful organization of today's function. My best wishes are always with the Institute. Thank you, Jai Sardar Devitya. I think this is a good illustration of the kind of challenges we are facing in distance and digital education. Very well illustrated. Yeah. Yes. My colleagues from I think Patel ji is on board, but audio is not there. So by Sri Bhairaka and Sri Vikabhi Sai, Dr. H. M. Patel Sai, Minister it. He was a voracious reader and a visionary, having excellent managing skills. This institute came into existence due to the, his uh, powerful vision. Today is his birthday. I am really happy that H. M. Patel Institute of English celebrate his birthday by inviting renowned experts from delivering memorial lecture every year. On behalf of Charuta Vidya Mandra and on my personal behalf, I pay tribute to Dr. H. M. Patel Sai. I am thankful of RIA for his thought provoking and memorial lecture. The chief guest, my colleagues from Sibia, principal invited guests, staff members and students. After the foundation of Charuta Vidya Mandal uh, by Sri Bhairaka and Sri Vikabhi Sai, Dr. H. M. Patel Sai minister it. He was a voracious reader and a visionary having excellent managing skills. This institute came into existence due to the, his uh, powerful vision. Today is his birthday. I am really happy that H. M. Patel Institute of English celebrate his birthday by inviting renowned experts from delivering memorial lecture every year. On behalf of Charuta Vidya Mandra and on my personal behalf, I pay tribute to Dr. H. M. Patel Sai. I am thankful to Dr. Ravi Narayan of RIA for his thought provoking and memorial lecture. And I congratulate Dr. Bose and his team for successful organization of today's function. My best wishes are always with the Institute. Thank you, Jai Sardar Devitya. Thank uh, you, sir, for kind blessings and presidential remarks. Uh, now, we are moving towards the end of the program. Uh, yes, friends. Uh, now we are moving towards the end of the program. I request Dr. Mayur Parmar, Vice President of the Institute for the Word of Thanks. Dr. Mayur. Hello, I hope I'm audible. Honorable Engineer Bhikubhai Patel Sahib, the Chairman of Chautar Vidya Mandal and President of today's function, Honorable Dr. Ravi Narayan Sir, Chief Guest of today's function, uh, the Secretary Sir, Joint Secretaries and all the torch bearers of Charutar Vidya Mandal, all the dignitaries who have joined online available now. I wish everybody once again a very good morning. As the Vice President of the Central Committee of HM Patel Institute, I really feel honored and rather privileged to propose the vote of thanks on this auspicious occasion. I begin with a special thanks to the chief guest of today's function, Dr. Ravi Narayan Sir from RIE Bangalore, who accepted our invitation and made it convenient to deliver the HM Patel Memorial Lecture 
at a very short notice uh, sir we are indeed very much grateful to you for your thought provoking ideas and also for the illuminating memorial lecture thank you thank, sir. You. thank you very yes. much thank you dr mayur uh, it is a matter of uh, pride and privilege to have engineer bikubai patel sahib chairman chautravidya mandal as the president of today's online memorial lecture i thank him for sparing his precious time out of his busy schedule and part of this function engineer bikubai patel sahib has always been a guiding lamp to this institute he has been kind and generous enough in providing exceptional guidance and support to all of us in all the possible ways sir on behalf of hm patel family i take this opportunity to express a deep sense of gratitude to you for having graced this occasion with your esteemed presence thank you very much sir i would like to extend uh, my warm greetings of gratitude towards dr s g patel sir honorary secretary chautra vidya mandal and principal r c talati sir the mentor of this institute for this precious present and continuous constant support my special thanks to padma bhushan dr amrita patel madam the learned daughter of shri achem patel sahib for being with us today madam is keenly involved as a member of board of studies and she guides the institute to make qualitative progress thanks a lot madam once again i thank talati sir all the joint secretaries of chautra vidya mandal esteemed invitees distinguished guests principals and heads of institutions of various departments of various institutions for registering their invaluable presence i also take this opportunity to thank our principal dr n v bose sir for his extensive support motivation and guidance thank you bose sir uh, my special thanks to professor mohan raj sir and dr r p jadeja sir for their enlightening comments ideas thank you sir for sharing let me also thank dr anil varsad the iqc coordinator for his prompt leadership and support thank you anil how can i forget all Uh, the members of the students council the faculty and the administrative technical staff of hm patel family they have supported us like anything thank you very much i specially thank vishal kanjaria sir for his technical support i might have missed anybody's name so kindly i apologize if i have done so once again directly indirectly who have who so has been involved in making this program a success i thank you everyone each and every individual thank you very much over to anil hmm. uh, thank you mayur uh, officially here ends the program uh, if there is any uh, point to discuss uh, we can uh, discuss if we have a time boss sir uh thank you very much revi for uh, accepting and delivering this uh, uh, thought provoking speech uh, i'm thankful to dr mohan raj and jarja sir to be with us for the whole program thank you everybody and thank you okay goodbye bye goodbye. okay bye. goodbye to you have a nice day bye thank you everyone bye thank you ravi bye thank you thank you bye bye